I want to welcome everybody in the audience that's with us. Thank you for joining this meeting. And most of all, thank you to Josh Enderley, who is the recycling and composting educator at the Cornell Cooperative, Ex Cooperative Extension of Broome County in Binghamton, New York. For the past four years, he has been teaching school lessons, public workshops, and hosting events for... <sighs> I, now I, I can't see what I was going to say. Um, I don't know how I can get out of this. Mm. Oh, Josh can tell. Okay, tell okay. <laughs> so ho ho hosting events for free access across the county. Josh also manages the community composting program, which has diverted more than 2,000 pounds of food scraps and the master composter recycler training program. So th thank you, Josh, for all you do in relation to helping Cornell Cooperative Extension and for helping the residents in the area uh, to educate them about composting, recycling, all the lessons you've given, and also for joining us tonight to give us this presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Josh, and, and uh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to share this presentation. This uh, the slides on here are geared towards recycling and what we offer throughout the county, the other programs that are at the landfill. Um, and for any composting and stuff, I can try to cover that as well afterwards or reuse. Um, but uh, we'll go through here. And if you have any questions, just throw them out. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. But if not, just unmute yourself and ask any clarifying questions that you have. Um, so to kind of just get started on how everything is picked up, um, it really depends on the hauler and where you're located. I know for uh, some locations, some instances, we've we've gotten calls of people saying they've put their recycling in the same truck as the trash. Um, we do like to see vigilant um, residents out there wanting to know that recycling is being collected by itself, um, being properly collected. Um, and one of the instances that we asked them to do is just to double check the kind of truck that they're 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 talking about. There are some trucks out there that have these these two bays, one with the for recycling, then the other for the trash. Um, really, depending on their routing, um, if they're able to collect two in one go, they'll probably do that. Um, so just double check that if that it's not a double sided truck, kind of like this one, um, just to make sure. Um, and if it does happen to be that way, where you see trucks and 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 the trash being picked up and then the recycling put in the same truck and it's not one of these, uh, definitely give a call to the county. Um, we they do our their best to reach out to the haulers and make sure that everything is cleanly collected um, and then sorted later. Um, because it is illegal in New York State to throw away recyclable materials into the landfill. Um, so that's on the on the collection side, um, and where all that goes. This was just to say that New York has a campaign about recycling and, and promoting proper recycling. So I just wanted to throw that out there. You probably see these posts, um, and they definitely want people to share these posts. So if, if your group ever feels the need to highlight recycling, um, recycle right, right New York. That their page, either on Facebook or Instagram has pretty good and very simple graphics about knowing what goes where. And the Broome County Recycles uh, page also shares that information too, and other graphics as well as more specific to our um, county and our programs. So of course, in the for the sorting side of things, all of these recyclable materials are dropped off at what's called the MRF. Uh, that's an acronym, uh, the Materials Recovery Facility the MRF for short, and that's what I'll refer to it from here on out. They have a series of sorting machines and employees that are picking out by hand, screening out what's either trash or different grades of like plastics. And what I like to, to highlight is that these machines, they tend to, uh, they do best at sorting out two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. Um, that roughly gets the paper, which is two-dimensional, and all the containers that are like plastic, metals, glass as three-dimensional. Um, so keeping that in mind as, as to what we can and can't recycle. 
And important why we want to have everyone flatten their cardboard boxes is just to kind of help everything be properly sorted that way. And it saves space too if you're, um, you know, flattening your cardboard. Um, so there's a series of, of different screens that, that screens out the, the paper and the, all the all the plastics, magnets to pull out all the ferrous materials, eddy currents to kind of push away all the aluminum, um, and then a series of like optical sorters that can sort through the different types of plastics too, um, all through like conveyor belt through a series of, of machines at the MRF. I mean, ours is, is uh, located in Appalachian, so it's a pretty close. We don't have to drive too far for our recyclables to be sorted. And then once sorted, they're baled and then sold um, to, to various vendors. Um, they, they're kind of private about where they sell the, them to just for like pricing reasons, but um, they're able to, to move all these materials. Um, just to kind of show like the life cycle of basically cardboard paper recycling, but this works well for other materials too. Um, there's just a lot of steps for, for recycling. As, as far as accepted materials, uh, we're going more on the side of keeping everything, you know, simple. So more or less what you see on this screen, we have a more detailed list on our website, uh, gobroomcounty.com slash solid waste. But as far as like papers go, what I like to say is if you can read, write, draw on it, or it's cardboard box, um, those papers are recyclable. Pizza boxes are okay as long as they're not like too greasy or too cheesy or anything like that. Uh, let's see, plastics, uh, really try to keep those to, to bottles as much as possible. Anything like black plastics, you know, you might get takeout containers like black plastics. Those are not recyclable. Uh, so we wanna keep those ones out. Um, anything really single use plastics tend to avoid those as well. So mostly bottles, food containers like that uh, should be fine. Gosh, uh, could I ask a question on that? They, they all have numbers one through six, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, some of the things you're referring to like food containers from or takeout containers will have one of those numbers, won't they? Yeah, most most plastics will have a number on them, uh, and usually they're surrounded by a triangle. And more often yeah. than not, the recycling symbol, right, the chasing arrows symbol. Um, don't worry about those at all. They say what kind of plastics they are. The way that we sort out recyclables, we don't necessarily go by that. We go more so as of what is this item. So if it's a if it's a bottle, if it's a plastic tub, um, then that's recyclable. Um, that makes it a little, little easier to sort. And those classifications, those types of items tend to be the same numbers anyways. So on your end, on the resident's end, you don't have to worry about the numbers at all. It could be a fun, I don't know, a tidbit information to know. I guess if you if you want to get into the weeds of what what kind of plastics you're using but it's not necessary for a proper sorting. Um, as long as you follow along with bottles and the more specific uh, recycle guideline that we have online, you'll be fine. May I ask a fo follow-up question on that? Yes. When you say don't worry about it, I guess I didn't think that those numbers indicated that they were recyclable necessarily. Yeah, you don't really have to worry about the numbers. But um, like, so say if you have something that's like a number seven, that 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 could be a whole host of things, like a plastic saucer plate, you know, for like serving. Um, that's that's trash because it's not like a food, like a containers kind of thing. It's like a flat plastic, so that's not on the list. That's a odd, strange number, so it's going to be trash. But uh, yeah, don't get too caught up on the numbers. Just go on like what it is. Um, Josh, if I could just follow up too. Uh, the only mm -hmm. problem with ignoring the numbers is that I've been in other places um, in other states mm -hmm. and they're totally hung up on the numbers. 
And you see this posted at transfer stations like, nope, no, no number five, you know, which is basically all your yogurt cups. Um, and, and there's a place in Cortland I noticed called Give Me Five, and they actually accept number five and deal with it exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, and so in other places, yeah, you got to look at these numbers or, you know, you're really not helping at all if you put non-recyclables into the recycling. Um, so so is, is there actually a market for this stuff at this point? Yeah, there, there, there are markets for like plastics and things like that. So um, a lot of the times with the type of recycling that's, that's prevalent now, mechanical recycling where the, the plastic is shredded and then basically is melted down and reformed. Um, more often than not, they're turned into something else that's like of lower grade. So maybe for plastic bottles, for example, shredded and then downgraded and used for like carpeting. Um, film plastics, um, which we'll, we'll talk about the more specifics later, uh, made into like treks and decking and, and such along those lines. Um, let's see, HDPE, so the number two is if you care, but the, um, the jugs for like detergent, those sorts of plastics turned into culverts. Um, so there are, there are markets for these uh, various plastics um, for sure. Uh, they just don't necessarily turn into the same exact thing, especially if they're food grade. There's been a lot of publicity on, on NPR and also I think other story in the paper recently about how a lot of these plastics that are supposedly recyclable actually aren't, that they actually have to throw them out because there's no markets for them. Are you disputing that? You know, that yeah, as far as I know, our, well, markets are very localized and it, it gets tricky with national news because it's, it's very different and the changing mm -hmm. markets are, are impacted have, have various impacts throughout the the, the country. I, mean, I, I found that very depressing, and I stopped sort of stopped worrying about you know the plastics when I you know whether they were recyclable or not. I decided most of them weren't probably. So well. yeah, a, a common thing that is told is that the amount of plastic, you know, like the nine percent of plastics get recycled. Well, there's a vast amount of plastic that just doesn't qualify to be recycled anyways. Um, and then a, a subset of that is stuff that's listed as accepted material. So I would say 9% is kind of misleading in that regard mm -hmm. for amount that we can recycle. Although we do an okay job at collecting the stuff that can be recycled to begin with. Um, there's always room for improvement on that front. But uh, as far as I can tell, and after visiting the Murph and talking to, to Bob Taylor, that he's able to find markets, he's pretty tenacious about it, for sure. This is Jim. I have a question. Uh, sure. Uh, I see on this <clears throat> graphic of accepted materials, it shows a milk carton and a juice carton. What uh, part of those containers... Uh, are useful? Is it the paper that's in them? Uh, they are also uh, lined with plastic. So uh, I don't know how mm -hmm. that could be recyclable, but perhaps you do. Yeah, so those materials, the the re stuff that they can recover is mostly the, the paper, as far as I can tell. They go through like a hydropulping process, big water slurry, and then the plastic floats and the paper sinks. So they're able to skim everything off the top and either, I don't know if they use the plastic as much or just throw that away and then able to recover the paper. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just wanted to chime in that uh, one of the advantages that Broome County has when it comes to markets is we've been in the business for a good long time. Uh, a lot of the uh, national news on uh, recycling uh, plastic is because it's it's tough to get into the business as we sit today. Uh, everybody's heard about the the, the Chinese markets uh, going away. Though it's interesting, uh, 
they went away because we sent uh, a lot of communities just sent them trash. They they didn't send them uh, well sorted material, which we were we never we had a a really we've had a really good track record for a good long time. So communities that have good track records and have been in existence tend not to have these problems. Uh, the only thing, the only other thing I'll say is actually China still wants these plastic. They were just tired of, uh, of uh, us sending trash. So they're actually investing in uh, recovery uh, facilities here in the States so they can be uh, get back into the business of getting this stuff because they still want it. They just don't want the contaminated stuff. Yeah, the um, the advent of single stream uh, that was it was nice and efficient, you know, as far as large collection and easy to tell people to put everything into one bin and they sort it out later. But that process just leads to more contamination in general. And then if that's what a lot of the country was doing and was able to get away with these high rates of contamination being you know, sold to China, then why not do it? You know, it saves money in the landfill side of things. But uh, since that changed, we have to deal with our wastes more, more onshore. And so there are increasing investments. And as, as well as the sorting is what Chris pointed out, it's also the, the paper mills themselves and a lot more investments being made. One from Chinese companies to Nine Dragons, from what I read last, like pumping millions and in, in buying these um, paper mills but a lot more of it going towards um, recycled uh, fibers and a lot for cardboard um, production. So there are investments being made uh, domestically for, for these products for recycling too. I just have a quick input. Um, my name is Allie and I'm the materials recovery, man recovery manager for Broome County. And um, those numbers that we were referring to earlier are, um, resin codes and we don't really go by those anymore because it is so confusing um, to tell people oh we only accept these certain numbers when in reality not all numbers not every single plastic of that number can be accepted so we try to refer to things as groups like bottles cans um, clamshells things that are and aren't recyclable in that format um, it just pretty much tells everyone what material that it's made out of not necessarily that is recyclable so not don't believe everything you see about the resin codes because even if it has chasing arrows on it it's not necessarily recyclable but even things like film plastics um may have the chasing arrows on it but it's not always re uh, recyclable in our curbside program so like film plastics can go to big box stores but they cannot be in the curbside bins so even though it's not recyclable in our program. It is technically recyclable. So you kind of have to be a little aware of that. It gets kind of tricky when you refer to numbers. Like I went to school in Pennsylvania and when we were going through recycling days, we'd have to separate our recyclables into like numbers two and three and then cans and aluminum cans and bottles. So different counties process things differently depending on the capacity of their MRFs and their sorting program. So that's a little tricky, but we do have that recycling guide on our website and you can always call or email us if you have any specific questions on if things are recyclable or not. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, can I ask one, one more thing before I forget? Sorry, uh, Josh, you mentioned you had spoken to Bob Taylor does he work for Broome County or, or does he work for a private company? A uh, private company, uh, Taylor Recycling. Yeah. Oh, Taylor Recycling. Taylor okay. Yep. Taylor, okay. And this facility you refer to as MRF, what is the actual acronym and what does it stand for? I didn't catch it. Yeah, MRF. So Materials Recovery Facility. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so as far as accepted materials go, um, I can either throw in the link later or send that in an email so everyone has that um, sorting chart. 
Um, so this is yeah, the, the resin identification codes. This is just what they tend to be. Um, I'll just move on from that. Uh, so we are highlighting uh, what can be recycled versus what can't. And the New York State has been coming out with information uh, about uh, common contaminants in the recycling stream. A lot of them being like tanglers. So things get that get tangled up in the machines, as you can see in this picture here. And all these stars, there's the like plastic bags. Sometimes there's even like ropes and hoses and um, ribbons, like plastic ribbons. All these sorts of things get physically caught in the machines where they have to stop, uh, stop, stop everything and cut them out. And then once they cut them out, then they can continue uh, sorting. Um, it is a, an, an issue and it's something that they've highlighted at our lo local facility too. Um, so plastic bags and making sure that people don't bag their recyclables, keep everything loose in your recycling bin as much as possible to avoid this situation. So it's to get more into specifics about what kind of things or how to prepare your recyclables uh, for paper and cardboard, it's like the credit card rule. If anything is smaller than a credit card, it's going to be too small to go through the whole recycling process. Um, Quarter sheet, I think, is, is really good, but credit cards is, is what we kind of go by um, as far as for, for sorting. Just because it, it is too difficult for the people to either physically pick out or just falls through the sorting machines themselves, um, and they'll just end up in the regular mm -hmm. garbage. So if, if anything smaller than the credit card, just, just throw it out. Uh, when it comes to like bottles and things and food containers, uh, as, as much as, as possible, rinse them out. Uh, I, I try to keep them towards the end of my dishwashing. I don't have a dishwasher, so I have to do it with, with the sink. So I wait until the water's already hot out of the out of the sink, throw a little bit in, just give it a, a quick shake and then dump and then recycle it that way. Because I would say um, what you, you see in the picture in the jars, just a little too dirty and, and, and for, for my liking anyways. So either rinse it out really quick with water or just get like a rubber spatula and scoop out as much as possible. Or if you're done with a little bit of like tomato sauce, what I like to do is throw a little um, like apple cider vinegar and then shake that and just get the rest out of the bottle to continue cooking. Um, but just rinse as much as possible. Do the labels on the on the bottles, and I have a lot of cat food cans, which I wash out, but I leave the labels on. Are the labels bad for stuff? Uh, you've seen a lot of the labels in the picture. Labels are fine. Um, they'll be okay. They'll either be washed off in the process once they get to the recycling facility, not the, not the MRF, but elsewhere. Um, so you don't have to worry about the, the labels so much. Okay. Uh, tanglers. This is what I was talking about with the stars that gets physically caught. Uh, this time of season is definitely going to be string lights. Um, while it makes sense that, you know, you know, metal is recyclable, the string lights just aren't. So keep those out of your recycling bin for sure. Ropes and hoses, of course, included as types of tanglers. Mm -hmm. Mixed packaging, so there, there are different types of packaging. So it's kind of starting at the bottom left here with the snacks, the crinkly wrappers, um, these sorts of things, not recyclable. I wouldn't, wouldn't throw them in. Crinkly plastic, one, it's flat, so it could easily get caught in the paper stream, contaminating the paper, um, that's not great. So anything like that, cliff bars, uh, potato chip bags, that's gonna be just straight in the garbage. Um, so like blister packaging, so like the plastic on top paper backing. When you separate them out, uh, plastic for sure is garbage. I suppose you could recycle the, the paper. Um, Allie, if, if that's the, the case here, if we haven't, change anything on that. I think that's the, the thing. 
yeah, as long as it doesn't have any of that um, front packaging on it, I mean, it's not going to be terrible. Uh, just make sure it's flattened out and it has none of that blister packaging on top. If it's one of those that um, that are a little bit tougher to open, you know, they have the crinkly edges, um, that's a definite no. I mean, if you can get the little, if you want to really get into it and get that little tiny um, informational sheet of uh, cardboard in there, you can take that out. But other than that, definitely a no. So like the, the information in the clamshell packaging, um, so it's like both sides are plastic kind of pressed together and the, the cardboard inside could be recycled, I suppose. Um, it's, so other, if, in, in light of like plastic pollution, a lot of plastic use, um, people can turn towards compostable plastics and packaging. Um, to me, it sounds great. Uh, and it is compostable. They do go through a rating system where in specific situations they do degrade and are compostable. However, for, for our purposes in this area, without having a large scale composting facility that's willing to take these um, items and barring having a large scale you know, facility in general, uh, it doesn't really matter because all this is going to end up in the garbage anyways. Because it's made to be compostable, it's not made to be recycled, so it's not recyclable. This stuff is is garbage. I doubt that the home compost system will get hot enough for long enough to be able to degrade these um, materials, these items. At least I haven't been able to, uh, and even in our community compost bins here where it gets pretty hot, uh, even just last week it was 140 degrees, but I would, I'd, I'd bet that I'd still see remnants of these um, compostable plastics even, even through that system. Josh, uh, isn't the problem with compostable plastic more that if they get uh, brought in with real plastic uh it's a contaminant to that system isn't it uh like recycling exactly yeah for sure that is also and, a tab and it's hard for the machines to really tell the difference uh it just gums up the works farther on down the the line uh mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree there. It seems like compostable plastic, if you can make a case for it at all, would be in fast food air, uh, uh, places that will collect it right there as a as a, a group of materials that they can send specifically to a dedicated composting place. Yeah, they have the, the volume for sure to be able to make it make sense, right. but I don't see that happening around here too soon, unfortunately. So as far as typical members of the public, if they end up with some of these compostable plastics, say from visiting a takeout restaurant or something like that, probably and they take it home, probably best to just trash it, right? Yep, just trash it. Okay, thank just you. Just throw it away. I do have an input on that as well. Um, most of our takeout containers, even if they are plastic, it's kind of the same idea where it does get, um, you know, it's harder to differentiate at the recycling facility, but anything that you take out, like any to-go containers with food, or if you buy a rotisserie chicken, even if it's a clear packaging, that does contain contaminants. So when it does um, get broken down, it contaminates all of the plastic, even if it was plastics that weren't contaminated, say like they weren't food containers, if they got mixed together, it would contaminate all the plastic that when it is broken down. So anything, even if you get a compostable container that had food in it, um, for example, it, we do recommend throwing it out even if you go, I don't know, to a restaurant and get a plastic container, you still should throw that out as well since it is contaminant. So whether it's compostable or plastic, we do ask that you throw that out if it had any sort of food in it. Even if you wash it? Correct. Um, that's the tough part. So the big thing on takeout containers is that it, 
has food in it long enough where it's getting into the particles. And it's very <laughs> in depth, but um, when it gets broken down, it does um, affect those tiny plastic particles. So it is considered a contaminant. Oh, so any takeout container, whether you get it from a Chinese uh, food place or Italian food place or whatever, whether it's aluminum, plastic, uh, just trash it, I guess, then. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's an unfortunate part about um, doing takeout is, like, for instance, I went to Tali's tonight and got um, chicken tenders. And for one, the bottom part is black, so that's not recyclable. And the top part had sauce and it had fries and it had chicken tenders all over it. And even if I wash it, it's not really justifiable for that type of plastic. So, I mean, if you wanna get into it and do like peanut butter jars or things like that, then that's a little bit different, but just because it's that type of plastic, um, it's a little bit more contaminated um, when they try to reuse it. So if you go to Little Venice or anything, you know, even if you wash it, it's still, you know, see that sauce residue. That's kind of what reminds me of it is you see like that residue on there that's considered a contaminant. So that's the tricky thicker. part about to go containers. I mean, if you get the thicker ones, like from Chinese food, um, you can reuse those. I reuse those for Tupperware and then use them until they pretty much go bad. And then I chuck them just because they have food contaminants on it. So the typical things you get at Wegmans, like strawberries or easy meals or I mean they're pretty much all trash. Uh yeah, they're considered clam shells. So we consider clam shells as garbage. Okay. Unfortunately. It's I, one of those I, things that's tricky. But um you think you think it's recyclable, but it's considered a clam shell and we don't recycle those because of the so containers of food. If it's a the rule of thumb is if it's a clam shell, um you, you trash it. Pretty much, yes. Okay. Is, That's is the that worst because, part about is, it. Is that because of the food contamination, the contamination from the person, or the plastic contamination? It's because of the food contaminating the plastic. What about uh, aluminum containers? That gets a little different. Um, if you can get most of that out, um, I don't see many people using aluminum containers, but um, we usually trash like if it's got like sauce or something, that's where right. I usually see it is like, like spaghetti. If you but go if you, to like Nick's or something. If you scrub it out, it's okay to recycle it. Um, we usually just say when in doubt, throw it out just because mm -hmm. of the contamination with food. Okay. That's where it gets hard. Um, go ahead, Josh, sorry. A lot of the, the Wegmans easy meals that you actually put in the oven are those aluminum uh, trays kind of that, you know, and they might have fish or chicken or something like that. But uh, sometimes that food gets baked on. It's hard to get off. Sometimes it seems like you can get it off if you soak it for a while. But you're saying it's like, don't do it at all. Yeah, it's like one of those things that you think you're cleaning it enough. Like you think you're washing your hands enough, but you still get sick kind of deal. <laughs> it's like yeah. you, you think you're cleaning it, but it gets into those particles. And especially that type of plastic, it just it just gets in there and once you break it down it's um you're unable to really process it any well, further i mean you think of like wegmans and it's like you just get tons of that stuff everything's in it and you just wish there could be some other way they could sell it to you exactly it's hard because of um it's you know it's cheap it's hard to switch from you know styrofoam to reusable or to compostable materials because it's it's not, you know, there's not a huge market for things. Um, it's getting bigger because there is a styrofoam ban, which Josh is going to talk about next. Um, but it's, you know. Well, I mean, these, these aren't styrofoam. They're, they're aluminum. Yeah. They're, they're number one or two or whatever, you know. But... Yeah. And it's just harder. Um, it's, it's not more, it's not widely available because it's not, you know, a huge market for it at the moment. Um, it's not, you know, as it gets moves on hopefully to become more where we can use reusable containers or things like that but just for the circumstances with the type of food that you get and the limit of um the limited market for reusable containers right now it's um it's you know you can get what you can get and hope for the best kind of deal i was afraid of that yeah <laughs> unfortunately that's how it goes but all right josh give I, us uh, our phone. 
Oh, sorry, Ellie. Um, yeah, I don't want to delay nope, this. Go ahead. Point, but there's a comment that a lot of us are apparently recycling things we shouldn't be. These food containers. Yeah. You know what? Um, but also, if you wash something really well, I mean, you can put it in the dishwasher. How does the recycling center even know the difference between that and something that didn't have food in it? That's um, that's kind of the hard part is, you know, we, they were, that someone mentioned earlier about differentiating like the compostable materials versus things that look similar when you recycle it, that it might not always get picked out, but once it gets passed on and, you know, they think it looks fine, they will pass right over it. And then when you break it down and try to make it new materials and they test it, then it's um, deemed contaminated. So oh, that's where so you don't really find out till later. Goes to the manufacturer. Okay, the the, the remanufacturer, or, or that's where the problem is found. Okay. There's one other question that I don't think got answered that was in the chat, and uh, people are asking, uh, should you take bottle caps or lids of jars off, or leave them on, or doesn't it matter? Uh, I would say lids of jars off, plastic caps can be left on. Um, just the way that those are sorted, similar to what we were talking about with the carton float sink, they're two separate plastics, so they're able to, <clears throat> to separate. But the credit card rule applies there, right? Yeah, but it's, if the cap is still on the bottle, then it's, then it's part of the whole thing. Okay. So be as far as like metal, I would keep the metal lids out personally, just because it's flat and I don't want it to get caught into the, the paper stream. Oh Allie, I think so, I saw you unmute before too. So leave the metal lids. Don't even recycle those. Just put the metal lids in the trash. Or take them off the jars and put them in the trash. You can um take those separate because those get pulled out by magnets um, when oh. they go through. But if you have uh, like soda bottle tops or like water bottle tops, we do ask that you leave those on so it will go because what well, it'll go with the bottle and get recycled. If you don't leave it on, then it'll fall through um, the sifter and it could, you know, not even be recycled in the long term. So it's okay. one of those that it's better if it stays on. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, to kind of add to the, the takeout situation and just kind of highlight a different program that's happening, not in our area, but um, in media anyways. I know in Ithaca, they have a, a volunteer like zero waste group. And one of their main programs is to talk to local, uh, local restaurants. And if they agree to allow uh, people to bring in their own containers to, for takeout, They'll put a little sticker and then they'll have them on a list of places that are that accept reusables. Um, so that's one way to reduce plastics as well in our communities. And what what they've been doing is get a lot of restaurants on board with this. Um, and what they did that was also helpful is that they they got a letter from the health department saying that them. this is okay and that this follows code if you're able, if you do this. So like there's no liability on the restaurant side, the the county's on board and they have written consent saying from the health department, you can do this. Um, and then the volunteer group from there asking restaurants, putting up a sticker, denoting that they're a zero waste restaurant or at least accept reusables. So I thought that was a, a, a great program, uh, something that's tangible to kind of combat against all these you know single plastics that we're that we're talking about because it does add up so, so i can bring my bugs back to uh dunkin dunkin donuts now and have them refilled i hope but i don't know it's, it depends on what they say what they want to do um yeah i i for me i don't know what our health department um views on that um, if they are pressed to say one way or the other. My my hope is that they would allow it, but I wonder if they need to 
be courted a little bit to get to that I, point. I, I think they need to be educated because that's been a big uh, bug for me that I, I can't bring my mug and my travel mug in and get it refilled. And that's like a very basic, basic one too, right? Exactly. Like just for coffee and yeah. David, but yeah. to be able to do other foods, so maybe you could get a, away with it. That's oh, a health it. department uh, thing that they need to be contacting the, the these people. I, I, I want, I, they have to get involved and I feel like it would be comforting for the restaurants themselves to, to hear from, from them. Absolutely. Hmm. You could maybe have the restaurant serve it on a plate and then you scrape it from the plate into your into your reusable container because that's just the path that they always take. But that seems a little silly to me, but whatever works at the time. I've done that lots. Take my own container to take food, to take like a doggy bag. I've, I've done that. And they, you don't even, they don't even know what you're that you're doing that yeah i don't think they'll really bother you about it it's already served they did their part you know you're you're yeah. taking it home they'd just be happy if you take it back because more often than not if i get takeout containers i leave it on the table so <laughs> well <laughs> if you take it with you somehow recycle it let's see um they dirty to plate Something that's kind of happening, I, I guess, sort of in the background, you probably have noticed is that there's just less styrofoam out there, um, phasing out foam packaging um, starting beginning of, of this year. Um, so I know I personally, whenever I purchased things and had things like delivered, I don't see the peanuts really much anymore. I see a lot more of like paper packaging. Um, I'm seeing more of like the rigid plastic takeout containers from whenever I eat out um, along those lines, not so much styrofoam containers. So um, yeah, styrofoam just being slowly phased out because it's it's a material that's not recyclable. Um, it's very lightweight and it just travels with the wind easy. So it becomes a uh, just pollution to the general area. Um, so styrofoam ban, you, not too much you can do about it, but it's a, it's it's more on the food service side that they have other options as well. And you've probably seen changes um, when when you're eating out and such. Are grocery stores supposed to phase that out for packaging things like meats, uh, fish, and stuff like that too? Because I still see those, that stuff. Those are items are exempt. Um, oh. Those are exempt <laughs> items. But as far as like. <laughs> consumer facing stuff it's still still present yeah uh let's see film plastics we talked about this a little bit before but there are various types of of plastics that can be recycled through these sorts of programs but not at the curbside so film plastics um think of them as as stretchy strong plastics so we're talking like over wraps bubble wrap, um, air pillows and packaging, sandwich bags, produce bags, bread bags, uh, newspapers, wraps, all these, they're like the stretchy plastics and they're considered film plastics, which can be taken back. Usually most grocery stores have uh, receptacles outside and in the front. I know uh, Wegmans definitely does and it's almost always overflowing. Um, plastic shopping bags, if you if you have those around still, those can be taken back to those uh, collection sites too. Um, same things about batteries. Uh, usually where you purchase batteries is where you can drop them off. But I know for sure, like uh, Broome County Library, you can bring some batteries in there. They have like take back programs. Um, you just want to tape the ends of your batteries uh, just to be on the safe side, um, regardless of the type, um, especially if they're lithium and rechargeable. But I like to be on the safe side, even if they're single use batteries, I still tape the ends of those um, and then take those back to be uh, recycled. And again, if you can't get up to the landfill, like uh, there's other places that are listed on the website 
but the Broome County Library has has a large metal receptacle for for all of the types. So alkaline, which are the usual single use batteries, uh, rechargeables, um, things along those lines. Oops. Uh, yeah, I'll just have info there. Um, our question has question on the batteries. <clears throat> oh yeah, let's go back to the batteries. Uh, I went into the uh, library with batteries, and they had uh, both alkaline and uh, uh, lithium, <clears throat> and uh, I knew what to do with the uh, alkaline, but I wasn't—I didn't know what to do with the lithium. There didn't seem to be a, a correct, uh, correctly labeled uh, receptacle for them. So they didn't have a spot in the in the library for one. Uh, I think they had re rechargeable and uh, single use. That was the seem seemed to be the way they broke it down. You're looking to rechargeable. I I think that that's correct regarding the county public library. I think that if you want to have a place for lithium batteries, Lowe's and um, Home Depot are better. Yeah, those places as well, for sure. Um, so other things in your household that are like hazardous that you shouldn't put onto the curb or pour down your drains. Um, so any like household cleaners, anything caustic, anything uh, weed killers or pest killers or things like that, uh, those can be dropped off at the landfill. Um, household hazardous waste days. Um, that's when they're free. Um, I don't know what the schedule is for 2023, but I'm pretty sure we have most of the year laid out already. So if you have any of those paper. things, then thinking ahead when you're doing spring cleaning or maybe just worry already. about it in the spring, then you can collect all these uh, cleaners and, and chemicals that you have in your house, garage, wherever, and then dispose of them there properly. Um, don't recommend dumping them down the drain. Uh, just wait until household hazardous waste day to take care of those. The uh, the 2023 hazardous waste uh, schedule was in the Binghamton Press, a big yellow article designed oh, to be cut out. It was in probably three times. Perfect. I don't get the paper anymore. Used to, but not anymore. Uh, that surprise is pretty pitiful. It's it's the the American press, it's AP, as far as I can tell, and maybe a couple local stories. But uh, as far as electronics recycling, things that are accepted, they're also accepted in the household hazardous waste days. Um, again, electronics not to be put on the curbside, but to be taken to special locations like Staples, Best Buy, um, those those locations. So monitors like printers really old TVs, um, those sorts of things are electronic that are qualified for recycling. Um, what don't qualify are small electronics and uh, countertop appliances. Well, as in like what's pictured here. So blenders, coffee makers, irons, food processors, those are all like mostly garbage. Um, well, mostly plastic, so they are to be thrown into the garbage. They're not recyclable. Uh, what about uh, old cell phones? Old cell phones? I'd take those back to like Best Buy or phone repair shop or somewhere like that for them to, to, to deal with. Or alternatively, keep them in your drawer for decades. But uh, well, that's you want to do some free clean. I, and of course, the main fear that we all have is uh, unless we totally destroyed it, we, you know, that data still may be readable. Um, and mm. one doesn't want that to happen. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, I guess you could either lock yourself out if you're worried about that and make sure they can't lock, I mean, log back in, or just take it somewhere that you trust that'll, that'll dispose of it properly. Wipe it as much as possible just to get the info off. Let's Same see. with old computers. Yeah, those at least with a hard drive. If you have a 
if it's a regular hard drive, you can just run a magnet over it or just impale it so it can't be used again. So then they can't get any info from it. So it's better to like one thing with a with a desktop where the, the, it was kind of big enough you could take it apart, but laptops are a little hard, you know, to to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. And my from what I can tell, uh, so I've I've been like trying to learn more and more about like repairing electronics, uh, computers, and cell phones and things like that. Um, I'm hoping that the trend that people are have been fed up with the fact that they can't repair what they own. So it's like, do you even own it if you can't fix it yourself? Uh, sort of sort of thing. So I'm hoping in the future, um, there the computers are becoming more and more repairable, and that that's the gold standard. I know I, one I company actually like, in in the um, climate action plan. Uh, it it does in fact, uh, you know, endorse the idea of things being repairable. Right. I. I sure hope so because it saves on a lot of electronic waste so you, you don't have to you don't give up on it too soon or you know have businesses make replacement parts available for purchase and and anything along those lines or make things work with third party parts uh because I know Apple has, has definitely been guilty of that where even if you buy two of brand new iPhones swap the screens the internals know that it's not the same screen and it won't work properly because of that. And that's a software thing. That's like an intention. That's a, a choice the company's made to make that happen. So, um, but yeah, there's a whole whole host of things that could be done better in terms of repairability in our electronics and, and things like that. As far as physical materials, uh, we promote reuse as much as possible. There's a space called the Eco Center that's at the landfill. So if you're doing any repairs and you have items to, to donate, uh, please drop them off to the Eco Center. Um, you can definitely use them just to keep it out of the landfill, it's still usable, and hopefully it can be used in, in, in future projects. Who, who can get that stuff? Who can what? Who can uh, pick up those uh, materials? County County residents. Okay. Yep. Thanks. So if you, if you know any if you have any friends that are contractors, definitely encourage them to to drop off materials in this uh, the, at the Eco Center if they don't need it for your future projects. Um, I will say um, there is interesting information um, happening. You know, things happening statewide. Conversations happening statewide as far as um, building materials, reusing but building materials and deconstruction. So if there's other like future meetings that you have that wanna go more in depth or just in general for general knowledge, I know there's a, a organization called Crowd. Um, what's, that, what's that? Circular, Circularity, Reuse and Zero Waste Development. So Crowd for short's the acronym. Um, and they're a group um, based in Ithaca, but like with statewide stakeholders that are looking into um, building like the economic infrastructure, like both physically and then also through legislation, things like that, to promote deconstruction of homes and buildings versus just demolition. Um, there was the they had their first summit this year, and I think they're going to continue to to have meetings and promote deconstruction, having policies in place that require like surveys. Of, of buildings to say how much material can be harvested from this, um, what can be reused um, and so on and so forth. So that's more of like a kind of developing thing. Um, it's really exciting to see because it's a lot of waste, construction and demolition is just a lot of waste that takes up in the landfill. And most of it just could be reused or recycled. Um, so I'm really excited about that development. Uh, more information can be found on, on their website and, and all that. So, uh, and I can send that info out as well to uh, links and stuff for everything that I mentioned here. Um, what else is offered at the landfill? Uh, earth machines are for sale. Maybe not the best time to start composting outdoors if you haven't built a bin yet, but uh, for sale for $45 cash or check. 
maybe in the springtime, if you need a new composter, uh, this could be an option. Um, textiles, so clothes and things, um, use it as much as you can. Um, donate what you're unable to use that other people can use. I would say if you can, if you have uh, textiles that are too ripped or too uh, stained to be reworn, try to make them into something you can use at home. So like rags and things, just throw away rags that you can sop up. But if it's if not, um, textile recycling um, is a thing. I know for sure um, Goodwill recycles all the clothes that can't be sold. Um, and these are usually turned into not necessarily new clothes, but um, insulation um, inside for, um, yeah, mostly insulation and other things that I, I don't wanna, I don't, aren't coming to the top of my mind at the moment, but um, they are recycled and, and made and used in different uh, applications. What am I, th what am I thinking? Like car stuffings for seats. Um, so all the old textiles can be used for that. Um, so what to look out for when you're buying new materials, new things. Um, I would say this one on the left, it's they're trying to they have a universal of like what can and can't be recycled. Um, this is usually correct, but of course, if it conflicts <coughs> with the Broome County standards, definitely follow Broome County versus what's printed on packaging always. Um, 100% recycled is okay. It's, Post-consumer means that it came out of like a MRF, so after it was sorted, after it was used. Sometimes they say a post-consumer or a pre-consumer. Um, either is, you know, recyclable stuff. Um, things to avoid, uh, greenwashing terms, common greenwashing terms are, are listed here. So like biodegradable, all natural, certified green there's no place that's certifying green you know items if it doesn't have like a specific organization labeled uh all these mean nothing really they're, they just want to sell it uh, because they know uh consumers want to do the right thing and make the right choice so these are kind of popping up more and more um the same with recyclability i know someone in the, in the chat earlier asked about k cups um, I'm pretty sure they were actually sued because their packaging had said that their cups are recyclable, whereas they're just not just about anywhere because of their size, they're too small. So um, definitely be a little wary of the marketing for, for these items until you can actually suss it out. But, um, and in, in terms of that, there's only so much we can do, you know, as consumers. Um, the best way to, to go about these things, um, follow the three R's, of course, reduce, reuse, recycle. And outside of that, push for, for ways for, for producers to make more recyclable things or more um, ways that we can like have reusable packaging instead. And so the New York State Product Stewardship Council um, pushing for like extended producer responsibility. So meaning putting the pressure back on who's producing all the, the packaging to make it recyclable, to make it be easy to be recycled and or come up with a system to take back what they produce to, to make it into new stuff. So instead of just having it solely on the consumer, which it has been for decades, I'm putting it back on the companies. And we already have uh, some of these in, in place, these EPR, Extended Producer Responsibilities. Um, so a lot of like the take back programs that we have, you know, the bottle bills, we can get the five cents back. Batteries we, we talked about before. Um, paint being a new one. Um, you can bring that back to your ha household hazardous waste. And I believe um, Sherwin-Williams will accept all types of paints as well. Um, so if you have excess paint, not going to use it, uh, recycle it uh, through this paint program. Um, so electronics, you know, pharmaceuticals, so on and so forth. And most recently, um, carpet EPR. I'm not entirely sure that it's 
been signed by the governor yet, but it seems poised to as it passed um, both houses. So we're, we should be set soon. And if anyone else, uh, Ali, if you know a little bit more about that, I tried to look it up, but um, yeah, carpet EPR to be up and coming because there's a lot of carpet that we just throw out that could be used to uh, repurpose for other things. So things that are proposed, um, like expanding the bottle bill to include like spirit bottles. So taking glass out of the single stream recycling into more of a, a collection in included in the bottle bill would be would be helpful. Um, improving the electronics law um, and having a framework for an overall framework for other materials instead of trying to go by individual you know items as they come up. Um, that's some of the things that uh, they're working on. And I know Deb Smith is is in the Product Stewardship Council, so very involved with the drafting this kind of legislation. Um, which is what I'm excited about, you know, Broome County for us, like we're, we're, we're trying to push more for EPR. Um, we do want to reduce, reuse and recycle as much as possible. So, um, yeah, and this is probably one of the best ways of, of, of going about it in conjunction with, of course, the individual action and recycling as much as you can. Um, so yeah, that's, that's more or less it for what's happening in Broome County. Um, this is my info. Uh, if you have any other further questions, I'd be happy to answer them and or be able to send out uh, other information later too. I have a question about the, the compost pile up at the landfill, if that's available to people. Is that ever tested for its, uh, for, for its uh, NPK and all that kind of stuff and pH? Uh, no, I don't believe that it's tested. You could test it on your own. Um, generally, compost, if it's done right, it should be fairly neutral um, for pH anyways. NPK, I mean, it really depends on what's going into it. And it's just hard to tell. Um, compost anyways, if you're, if you're using it, think of it less as a fertilizer and more of like a soil conditioner where the benefits are really coming from the microbes that are in the compost uh, more so than the nutrient content. But um, yeah, I think they still have a big pile available. Uh, Jim, question? Yeah. Um, Josh, have you run across um, a, a, a model municipality or country that uh, seems to be doing everything right around recycling? No. Eh. <laughs> Not e exactly coming to mind. I feel like a lot of them are, are coming through this similar issues, especially in, in this country. Mm. Um, it seems to be what we got. I would rather see us do like, I, I would like to see I think dual stream is a pretty good approach for things just to kind of clean up the stream because it's easier for folks to to know, okay, paper and stuff just goes here, containers this way, and it seems like less likelihood of contamination that way. So um, <clears throat> otherwise it's yeah. Okay. And uh um I I missed getting the uh the website to uh to uh look up this um, information. Is is that available? Yeah, go broomcounty.com slash solid waste. Okay, thank you. I, I just want to mention the recycling facility in Walton, New York, and Delaware County, which is basically single stream. They call out uh, construction debris, goes through two big uh two big tunnels that rotate to separate big from little and light from heavy. And it ends up as a compost. They have like, uh, I think, 10 compost bins that are continually aerated. And it would make a, a really great field trip for Sierra Club. They, they, they used to like tours, you know, pre-COVID and everything's different now. But I think they'd still welcome tours. And it's tr tremendously educational experience. And it's a facility that was state-of-the-art. It was imported from Canada. But, and it's probably 
no longer state of the art, but it's a pretty effective uh, model for getting rid of stuff. And it all, you know, you end up with some landfill, but their landfill uh, components is a whole lot smaller now as a, as a result of that facility. Kevin, have you been there in the last few years? Have I? Yeah. Uh, no, it's been a while. It's been six, seven, eight, maybe even nine yeah. years. Yeah, because we did have a, a field trip there. Yeah, I think I might have went well, with, well, with you on that one. It could and have been. Bunch, a bunch of us went. Um, I just did a presentation with the... Uh, with the guy who operates that. So they're still going strong. Um, the other thing I would suggest that uh, both for the Delaware composting and uh, Taylor, they both have uh, websites where uh, they have good videos on the process. So uh, it, it's uh, better, than, better than nothing. But, but Taylor's not composting now, are they? No, I, I, Delaware County for the composting, but Taylor for uh, the MRF. Yeah, Taylor was talking about composting, but it got complicated. And I forget exactly why, but it's not an easy thing to do. Is Taylor related or the same as the Taylor that runs Taylor Garbage? Yes. Yes. I would just also like to say that I have been separating paper and plastics and uh, glass ever since the very beginning. It's simple as can be. I just do not understand why it seems to be, they think it's so hard for the general public to do it because I, I just find it just easy as pie and I still keep doing it even though I don't need to. Yeah, yeah I, I do too, but uh, I think- I, Josh, I know it doesn't work, but it just annoys me. I mean, it's just, it seems so Josh easy Josh has a, the right idea with the, uh, we should at least be separating the glass out again because the glass can break and that's uh, that's a big contaminant with the paper. It's a hazard um, for, for sorting for sure. Um, Cause at, at the facility, all the, all the bottles are crushed cause it's a lot more efficient to, to ship them as call it, you know, crushed glass. So. Um, Josh, one last uh, question, which is, it seems like uh, we, we have our, our uh, you know, trash and recycling pickup in Southside Binghamton on, on Tuesday mornings, which is very early. And so we put it out the night before. It, it seems like it always rains or, or snow <laughs> that night. And so I'm wondering about how, how important is it that the paper recycling stays dry? It's definitely helpful if the paper is dry. I understand it's not always possible. Um, it would be preferable to keep it as, as dry as possible. So if, if you can cover it somehow or put like one large cardboard box on top so it soaks everything up, you know, kind of thing. Um, as far as I can tell, it seems all right. Not ideal, but it seems all right. If it's going to pour overnight, maybe don't don't set it out. Try to get it there in the morning. But um, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know about in Broome County, but in Tioga, where Taylor picks up the uh, recyclables, it's in a bin with a lid. And it's in one of those trucks that picks up the whole bin, dumps it in, and puts it back down. So it's got a top. No, we don't have that in Binghamton. So no. uh, we get these open, you know, recycle uh, bins from the landfill, actually, and, and uh, they don't have a cover. Hmm. I have a question about political signs. They're sort of a plastic, but they look like corrugated cardboard, but they're plastic. Is that recyclable or is that trash? That's trash. <laughs> it's, Bummer. It's political. <laughs> what about foam? It, uh, the metal stands you can recycle. You should be able to, they're metal. If you, if you take them to some place that does scrap metal, 
Oh, the, you don't want I, to put those in the recycle bin. No. Cans only. Just two cans. I, I put a link in the chat and that goes to the Broom County Recycle Guide. And let's see, recycling program basics. Here, maybe and, the and, second and I link. Put a, I put a link to the uh, hazardous waste. They do have the schedule out on their website. Oh, perfect. Broom County, Broom County does. Yeah, I haven't seen the chat the, the whole time I was presenting, so sorry if I missed something. Well, yeah, let's just ask anybody that put something in the chat that thinks it didn't get addressed to speak up, then that makes it easier on us and Josh. I, I have a question. Uh, recycled bottles were got five cents a, a bottle in the 1950s. Why has that price not increased to, stay, to keep up with the time so that people really did recycle them or at least return them? Yeah, the programs that have a higher deposit rate, they have a, you know, there's a higher recycling rate too. So I, okay. I don't need to Michigan, watch somewhere that has like 10 cents, they have like 85% yeah, return rate versus okay. like New York, which only has like 70, 75%. Um, so that's that would be included in the bottle bill expansion. Would I, I would like to see anyways an in, increase in price? Um, there are okay. other entities that would be against that, so like the grocer is. or maybe even oh. the 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 beverage companies themselves because they don't want the prices to be higher. You know, putting oh, on the consumer yeah. and all that stuff. But um, I don't know. A higher higher return rate would incentivize people to re actually return it and then it'd be a higher rate of return if the if there's a higher deposit uh one more on the, the glass recycling is uh seems like a, a lot of bottles they have like oh a foil wrapper or a plastic wrapper kind of at at the where the top is and it's it's sometimes hard to get those off does, do they need to be off though for that bottle to be recyclable? Um, it should be, I, I mean, if you wanna to try to get, take them off, take them off, but uh, they should be able to be washed away after the glass is crushed. Like, I mean, some of them are like metal, like wine bottles, you know, and it's like, you, you might actually cut yourself trying to get them off, um, but, and, and obviously there are different materials in the glass. So I guess, so we should try to get them off if we can. Yeah. Okay. Is colored glass all right? Brown? I'm pretty sure, yeah. Allie, I just wanted to check with you on that. Um, yeah, clear, brown, green, pretty sure. Yep. Yeah, I know it is. Wine too. Thank you. Well, Josh, I don't know. Uh, any other last questions? It's close to nine. It's a holiday week, so maybe we should let Josh uh, take the rest of the day off. But uh, <laughs> is this it for everybody? Many thanks. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yeah. It was very Thank interesting. You, Josh, and, and Allie well, too. I, I have I have one comment to everybody. If anybody has an idea for a speaker to give a future presentation, please contact me or somebody else on the executive committee uh, to let us know, uh, because we are still trying to get line up speakers for the spring. Right now, we only have January filled up. We've sent some you know, messages out to a couple of people for February, March, but so far we haven't had luck getting a response. So it's, it's not as easy as you might think. Mm. Even people that you've talked to in the past, sometimes they say they're going to, but they're busy. And then you contact them, you know, months later when they say they should not be busy. And then, and you find out that they're working second shift, for example, which happened with one of the people that I was hoping to to have them give a talk in the spring. So mm -hmm. now I, you know, that's another person that basically is an, an impossibility, at least for now. Okay. So anybody that has ideas,